Chapter 11 After a time, I discovered that I was cold and wet and with little pools of water about me on the stair carpet. I got up, went into the dining room and drank some whiskey. Then I was moved to change my clothes. After I had done that, I went upstairs to my study. But why I did so, I do not know. The window of my study looks over the trees and the railway towards Horshall Common. In the hurry of our departure, this window had been left open. The thunderstorm had passed. The towers of the Oriental College and the pine trees about it had gone. And very far away, lit by a vivid red glare, the common about the sand pits was visible. Huge black shapes grotesque and strange, moved busily to and fro. It seemed as if the whole country in that direction was on fire. I could not see what the Martian shapes were doing, nor the clear form of them. Neither could I see the nearer fire, though the reflections of it danced on the wall and ceiling of the study. A sharp tang of burning was in the air. I closed the door noiselessly and crept towards the window. As I did so, the view opened out until, on the one hand, it reached to the houses about Woking Station and on the other to the charred and blackened pine woods of Byfleet. There was a light down below the hill on the railway near the arch and several of the houses along the Maybury Road and the streets near the station were glowing ruins. The light upon the railway puzzled me at first. A black heap, a vivid glare, and to the right of that, a row of yellow oblongs. Then I perceived this was a wrecked train. The front part smashed and on fire. The rear carriages still upon the rails. At first, I could distinguish no people at all, though I peered intently for them. Later, I saw against the light of Woking Station a number of black figures hurrying one after the other across the line. And this was the little world in which I had been living securely for years, this fiery chaos. I turned my desk chair to the window, sat down, and stared at the blackened country, and particularly at the three gigantic black things that were going to and fro in the glare about the sand pits. A soldier came into my garden. I heard a slight scraping at the fence, and rousing myself from the lethargy that had fallen upon me, I looked down and saw him dimly clambering over the palings. At the sight of another human being, my torpor passed, and I leaned out of the window eagerly. Hist! I said in a whisper. He stopped astride of the fence in doubt. Then he came over and across the lawn to the corner of the house. He bent down and stepped softly. Who's there? he said, also whispering, standing under the window, peering up. Where are you going? I asked. God knows. Are you trying to hide? That's it. Come into the house, I said. I went down, unfastened the door and let him in. Then I locked the door again. I could not see his face. He was hatless and his coat was unbuttoned. My God, he said as I drew him in. What has happened? I asked. In the obscurity, I could see he made a gesture of despair. They wiped us out, simply wiped us out, he repeated again and again. He followed me into the dining room. Take some whiskey, I said, pouring out a stiff dose. He drank it. Then abruptly, he sat down before the table put his head on his arms and began to sob. It was a long time before
before he could steady his nerves to answer my questions. And then he answered perplexingly and brokenly. He was a driver in the artillery and had only come into action about seven. At that time, firing was going on across the common. The first party of Martians were crawling slowly towards their second cylinder under cover of a metal shield. The soldier's horse trod in a rabbit hole and came down, throwing him into a depression of the ground. At the same moment, the gun exploded behind him. The ammunition blew up. There was fire all about him and he found himself lying under a heap of charred dead men and dead horses. I lay still, he said, scared out of my wits with a horse atop of me. We'd been wiped out and the smell, good God, like burnt meat. I was hurt across the back by the fall of the horse and there I had to lie until I felt better. He had hid under the dead horse for a long time, peeping out furtively across the common. In a few minutes, there was, so far as the soldier could see, not a living thing left upon the common, and every bush and tree upon it that was not already a blackened skeleton was burning. The artilleryman managed to escape to Woking. It seems there were a few people alive there, frantic for the most part, and many burned and scalded. He hid among some almost scorching heaps of broken wall. After nightfall, the artilleryman made a rush for it and got over the railway embankment. Since then, he had been moving towards Maybury in the hope of getting out of danger. People were hiding in trenches and cellars and many of the survivors had made off towards Working Village and Sand. He found one of the mortar mains near the railway arch smashed and the water bubbling out like a spring upon the road. That was the story I got from him bit by bit. He grew calmer telling me. I began to see his face blackened and haggard as no doubt mine was also. I looked again out of the open window. In one night, the valley had become a valley of ashes.